I know you've been sitting around watching a lot of videos lately, so I wanted you to say hello to my lecture recording buddy, Rocky. Say hi, Rocky. You a good boy? This video will cover opioid pharmacology. This video will be slightly longer than some of the previous ones in the pain unit because we have several agents to cover that are part of the opioid drug class. The video will begin with a thorough description of the activity and pharmacology of morphine, which is the prototypic opioid agonist, and the one to which all other opioid agonist drugs that produce pain relief are compared. So spend the most time focusing on morphine and understanding its pharmacology before moving on to the other agents. Within the opioid drug class, there are several pharmacologic classes to discuss. First, we have the strong opioid agonists. These produce pain relief or analgesia when they are given to humans. Next, we have the mixed agonist antagonist drugs, primary example of that being buprenorphine. And these drugs also produce pain relief but have some other interesting activity as well. Next, we have the dual acting opioids like tramadol. These are drugs that activate both opioid receptors as well as other neurotransmitter receptors and channels. And finally, we have the opioid antagonists like naloxone that have varied uses, including the treatment of opioid overdose and opioid use disorder. The opioid alkaloids, including morphine, are all found in the substance opium. Opium comes from the Greek word opos, which means juice, which is fitting considering that opium comes from the sap or the juice of the opium poppy plant, Papaver somniferum. Morphine makes up about 10% of raw opium, and it was first isolated in 1803, when it was named for Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. This is fitting given the very common sedating effect of morphine and similar drugs. Morphine has been used for centuries as a pain relieving agent and its use has come in and out of fashion over the times. Morphine was even used as a treatment for cough and other ailments in children as young as three months old. Clearly times have changed. Morphine produces its effects by acting on opioid receptors found within the body. There are four different types of opioid receptors, including the mu opioid receptor, or MORE, the kappa opioid receptor, or CORE, the delta opioid receptor, or DOR, and the nociceptin receptor, also abbreviated NOP and ORL1. Even though morphine has activity at all opioid receptor types, the primary effects are due to its activation or agonism of the mu opioid receptor. Morphine produces both its analgesic effects as well as its addictive effects by activating the mu opioid receptor. In addition, activation of this receptor produces physiologic effects such as sedation, euphoria, which is linked to its addictive properties, respiratory depression, constipation, and altered hormone and neurotransmitter release throughout the body. Morphine has more minor activity at the other opioid receptor subtypes, but it's worth reviewing their physiologic effects nonetheless. Activation of the kappa receptor produces analgesia, but it also produces dysphoria, which can be very disorienting and unpleasant to humans. Activation of this receptor also has psychomimetic effects as well as producing constipation. Activation of the delta opioid receptor also produces analgesia and alters the release of many hormones and neurotransmitters. Not as much is known about the nociceptin receptor. It is thought that activation of this receptor can produce analgesia as well, but it also has roles in many other central nervous system processes as shown here. 
the physiologic effects of morphine are strong and wide ranging because the mu opioid receptor is found throughout almost the entire body. Morphine produces several effects by activating receptors in the central nervous system. These effects include analgesia, euphoria, sedation, respiratory depression, antitussive or cough suppressant activity, nausea and vomiting, meiosis or pupil constriction, hyperthermia or increased body temperature, and also reduced sleep quality. In addition to central effects, morphine also produces physiologic effects through peripheral action on end organs and peripheral cells. These include effects such as bradycardia, hypotension, constipation, and pruritus or itching. An important aspect of the physiology of morphine is its ability to produce tolerance. Tolerance is the gradual loss of effectiveness of a drug over time with repeated dosing. This means that some of the effects of morphine diminish over time with repeated use and higher doses of the drug are required to produce that effect. Tolerance develops with high frequency to the effects of analgesia, euphoria, sedation, respiratory depression, nausea, vomiting, and the antitussive effects. This is often problematic because the analgesic effects are the ones for which morphine is utilized. And if tolerance develops, higher doses of morphine are required to produce the same pain relieving effects as before. There is moderate tolerance that develops to the bradycardic effects and therefore over time, the use of morphine has less and less of an effect on the heart muscle. However, there is minimal tolerance that develops to the effects of meiosis, constipation, and the convulsant effect of morphine. This means that over time, even after repeated use, the effects of morphine to cause meiosis and constipation continue. And with higher doses of morphine, these effects become even more pronounced and even more problematic. One way to summarize this is to say that as you increase the dose of morphine because of the development of analgesic tolerance, you also get higher and higher levels of the physiologic effects on the right side of the table because minimal tolerance develops to those effects. In general, the absorption of morphine is incomplete. There is high first pass effect when morphine is taken orally, and therefore the oral dose of morphine is always higher than the parenteral dose due to the first pass effect. The absorption of morphine has high interpatient variability, and that's why the physiologic effects should be monitored on an individual basis to ensure adequacy. Morphine distributes to highly perfused tissues very rapidly. And these include tissues like the brain, the lungs, and the liver. Morphine is metabolized to mostly polar metabolites by the process of glucuronidation. And then those metabolites are excreted in the urine. Many opioids have these same pharmacokinetics, but where there are differences, I will point them out along the way. Given the physiologic effects of morphine, it is clear that there could be some problematic drug-drug interactions or physiologic contraindications to prevent the development of toxicity. Because morphine itself is sedating, when given with other sedative hypnotic drugs, it can increase central nervous system depression and lead to a risk of coma. In addition, due to these sedative effects, morphine is contraindicated to be administered with antipsychotics due to the potential for high sedation and also complicating cardiovascular effects. It is also contraindicated to be administered with drugs that are also hyperthermic and can increase core body temperature, such as the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, because this can lead to coma and even death. Morphine, which is a strong opioid agonist, should not be administered with an opioid antagonist because that could precipitate a withdrawal syndrome in dependent individuals. 
More on this will come very shortly in this video. And finally, morphine is contraindicated during pregnancy because it does cross the placental barrier and can lead to dependence in the fetus. The use of morphine is associated with several adverse drug reactions or adverse drug effects. On an acute basis, so immediately after administration, the ADRs to watch out for include respiratory depression and potentially to the point of stopping respiration altogether, nausea and vomiting in some individuals, and this is especially more prevalent in ambulatory individuals, as well as constipation. With long-term use, there is the development of several adverse effects that I will describe now. The first is tolerance, as we heard about already. Tolerance is the gradual loss of effectiveness with repeated dosing. And when using morphine for pain relief, this means that higher doses of morphine are required to produce adequate analgesia. Chronic use can also lead to dependence, which is a physiologic change with repeated dosing that results in a withdrawal syndrome on either drug discontinuation or administration of an antagonist or antidote. The withdrawal syndrome can be very unpleasant for most individuals, and therefore upon stopping an opioid drug like morphine, typically some kind of taper is recommended. And finally, morphine is also highly addictive. Addiction, by definition, is compulsive behavior or compulsive drug seeking despite negative consequences. Given the strong euphoric effects that morphine produces and the strong release of dopamine in the central nervous system, morphine is highly addictive and individuals can develop opioid use disorder that leads to compulsive drug use even in the face of, of negative consequences. The morphine-like agonists include the drugs morphine, hydromorphone, oxymorphone, codeine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone. These drugs differ in structure, as you will also learn. But in general, when it comes to the pharmacology of these agents, they all produce analgesia by activating the mu opioid receptor though they do differ in their potency compared to morphine and in their maximal analgesic efficacy. Morphine remains the standard opioid agonist against which all other opioid agonists are compared. As you can see in this table, the morphine derivatives hydromorphone and oxymorphone are six and 12 times more potent than morphine respectively. All three of the morphine derivatives, including morphine, are considered to have high analgesic efficacy. Codeine is less potent than morphine and is considered a low efficacy analgesic. The codeine derivatives hydrocodone and oxycodone have increased potency relative to codeine, but are still either equipotent or about half as potent as morphine they are considered to have moderate analgesic efficacy. One important thing to note about codeine especially, but also hydrocodone and oxycodone, is that these drugs are prodrugs. They are activated in the body by metabolism through cytochrome P450 CYP2D6, which is polymorphic. This can lead to some important considerations when considering pharmacogenomics of individuals that are using codeine, hydrocodone, or oxycodone. Opioid pharmacogenomics will be covered in a separate video. The next group of opioid agonists are the fentanyl-like agonists. These are drugs including fentanyl and some derivatives, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, and remifentanyl. They differ structurally from morphine, and as you can see, they also, also differ by their relative potency to morphine. Fentanyl is about 80 times more potent than morphine, and the derivatives sufentanyl and remifentanyl are on the order of 500 times more potent than morphine. All the fentanyl-like agonists are considered high-efficacy analgesics. 
An important thing to note about fentanyl is that it is metabolized to an inactive drug by cytochrome P450 CYP3A4. CYP3A4 activity is modified by smoking, among other changes, and therefore a table of drug-drug interactions should be consulted whenever fentanyl is administered. Another important difference of the fentanyl-like agonists compared to morphine is that they are very short-acting. And therefore, they are primarily used to produce analgesia when given parenterally as an anesthetic adjuvant. Fentanyl itself is also commonly administered for the treatment of breakthrough cancer pain. And for that reason, it comes in many different formulations that are easier for individuals with cancer to take orally due to issues with nausea and vomiting. These formulations include a patch, a buccal film, a buccal tablet, oral lozenge, uh, injection, a mouth spray, a nasal spray, and a sublingual tablet. And again, the rationale for all of these different formulations is to bypass nausea and vomiting, which would be problematic with an oral tablet formulation in individuals with cancer. Another strong opioid agonist used clinically is methadone. Although methadone is more frequently used in addiction recovery rather than in pain relief, it is able to produce significant analgesia. Its utility in addiction recovery is due to its much longer duration of action compared with morphine. One interesting thing about methadone's activity is that when given as a racemic mixture, the R or minus enantiomer is analgesic, whereas the S or plus enantiomer blocks NMDA receptors. This, first of all, gives it the potential to be efficacious in the treatment of neuropathic pain, given that it's blocking an ion channel. However, this also gives it cardiotoxic side effects because NMDA blockade is associated with QT prolongation. Methadone has many active metabolites, and these are formed by P450 metabolism through CYP2C19, 2B6, and 3A4. Inhibition of these enzymes can potentially lead to fatal toxicity because of increased active methadone concentrations, and therefore a table of drug-drug interactions should be consulted whenever methadone is administered. The next strong opioid agonist I will mention is meperidine. Meperidine is a fairly strong to moderate opioid agonist that produces analgesia also by activating the mu opioid receptor, similar to the other agonists we've covered. One side effect associated with the use of meperidine that is different than some of the other opioid agonists is that it causes profound hypotension, which is actually secondary to the release of large quantities of histamine. It has higher oral bioavailability than morphine, about 40 to 60 percent. But there is the risk of seizure because one of its metabolites, normaparidine, which is formed by CYP3A4 metabolism, can increase the risk of seizure by reducing the seizure threshold. Finally, another opioid agonist with unique activity is loperamide. Loperamide is an opioid agonist, but it is restricted to the periphery of the body and is not able to cross the blood-brain barrier because it is excluded by P-glycoprotein drug efflux transporter. This means it's not able to get into the brain to cause the analgesic and euphoric effects, but it is able to act in the gastrointestinal tract to produce a strong constipating effect. For that reason, loperamide is an effective anti-diarrheal medication and is available over-the-counter for this purpose. It produces its effects by directly activating new opioid receptors in the gastrointestinal tract to produce constipation, decrease gastric motility, and decrease gastric emptying. The next pharmacologic class of opioids I will talk about are the mixed agonist antagonist drugs. The two that I will mention are butorphanol and buprenorphine.
the mixed activity of these agents is at the mu opioid receptor and the kappa opioid receptor. Butorphanol, which is available as a nasal spray, is a kappa opioid receptor agonist, as well as a mu opioid receptor antagonist. It actually has higher potency than morphine, about five times more potent, but its maximal analgesic efficacy is only considered to be moderate. And the analgesia it produces is limited by the development of dysphoria, which is mediated by the kappa opioid receptor agonist activity. In addition, in an individual who uses opioids and has become dependent, butorphanol can precipitate withdrawal because of its mu opioid receptor antagonist activity. The other mixed agonist antagonist is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor, as well as having kappa opioid receptor agonist activity. It is on the order of 20 to 50 times more potent than morphine and is also considered a moderate efficacy analgesic. Like methadone, buprenorphine is more commonly used in addiction recovery than it is for pain relief. But the interesting thing about buprenorphine is that it has a ceiling effect with regard to some of the toxic side effects of morphine, such as respiratory depression. Buprenorphine produces a maximal ceiling of respiratory depression and is therefore considered commonly to be non-lethal, even at very high doses. It is useful in addiction recovery due to its longer half-life than morphine. And for that reason, it's available in several formulations that are useful for individuals who are undergoing treatment for opioid use disorder, including a buccal film, a subcutaneous implant, a patch, injection, and a sublingual tablet. The use of buprenorphine in individuals who are opioid dependent can also precipitate withdrawal. Because it is only a mu partial agonist, this can serve as an antagonist activity when buprenorphine is administered at the same time as an agonist, such as morphine. And therefore, care should be taken when administering buprenorphine to an opioid-dependent individual who is undergoing treatment for opioid use disorder. The next pharmacologic class of opioids are the dual-acting drugs. Tramadol and Tepentadol. These drugs are agonists at the mu opioid receptor, and they also inhibit neurotransmitter reuptake transporters. In the case of tramadol, it inhibits both serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake by inhibiting CERT and NET, respectively. Tramadol, like codeine, is a prodrug that must be metabolized by CYP2D6 to its active form and therefore is subject to some of the opioid pharmacogenomics that will be discussed in the next video. Given the strong CERT and NET inhibition, most of the adverse effects of tramadol are associated with increased serotonin and norepinephrine concentrations. And these include suicidal ideation, serotonin syndrome, tachycardia, and hypertension. Tepentadol is both a mu opioid receptor agonist and a norepinephrine reuptake transporter inhibitor, or NET inhibitor. It has strong enough mu agonist activity to produce respiratory depression, so that may be of concern with tepentadol. It also can produce constipation by mu opioid receptor activation. The norepinephrine reuptake inhibition is able to cause hypertension. Last, we'll talk about the opioid antagonist pharmacologic class. Some general principles to keep in mind when considering opioid antagonists is that these drugs have no effect when they are administered alone to an opioid naive individual. This means that someone who has either never taken opioids or someone who has not taken them for a long period of time and therefore is not dependent, when administered an opioid antagonist, it tends to have no or very little physiologic effects. What opioid antagonists can do, however, is immediately reverse the effects of a strong agonist like morphine. In this regard, they act as somewhat of an antidote for overdose on morphine or other strong opioid agonists like fentanyl and heroin. However, 
in the same regard, they can precipitate withdrawal in dependent individuals. So someone who has been using opioids for a long period of time would develop a withdrawal syndrome if they were to be administered an opioid antagonist. There are three main groupings of opioid antagonists that I will discuss. The first is naloxone, which when administered parenterally is used to reverse opioid overdose. This is because naloxone has, has really no to very little oral bioavailability. The next grouping includes naltrexone, which although is very similar in structure to naloxone, it does have oral bioavailability and can be administered as an oral treatment for addiction recovery and abstinence. It is FDA approved in the treatment of both opioid and alcohol use disorder. The last group are opioid antagonists that are used to either prevent or reverse opioid induced constipation. These include methylnaltrexone, naloxagol, and alvimapan. These are peripherally restricted opioid antagonists that act only on the GI tract to reverse the constipating effects of opioids without reversing their central analgesic effects. Now is a good time to stop and review the opioid drugs that we've covered. One way that you can do this is by creating a list of opioids and specifically the opioid agonist, mixed agonist antagonist, and the dual acting opioids, and describe their corresponding equi-analgesic dosing. In other words, how do all of the opioid drugs that we've discussed compare in terms of potency to morphine, the standard opioid? Snap a photo of the QR code on the screen if you need some assistance answering this question.